uh, over uh, Steve, uh, Peter Ducey. Uh, I love Peter. I know Peter. He's a great guy. Uh, actually called out uh, Joe Biden again to uh, what's her name? John Luke Picard, uh, Marie Picard. What's her name? Chris? I, I, I actually forgot. I shouldn't. <laughs> Marie Please forget Picard. her name. Um, anyway, Pisaki part two. Yeah. So he, he said uh, the president lied. The economies in all these other nations aren't worse than ours. They're they're not as bad as ours. Why did the president say that? Well, to Jay's point, it's like he's just trying to distract about the fact that he, that he's created something that he can't control. And uh, I think we're going to see a real economic um, challenge. I think we're in recession. I think we could see depression by September. And this is because they did three things to prompt it. First, they flooded the economy with money at a time that it, 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 you, you shouldn't have put it in because you wanted people to go back to work, not slow them down and prevent you know all this cash and then not enough goods to go with it. Secondly, the energy thing is, is just problematic. The moment you pull the United States out of being energy independent, you put us in the, in the same boat as, as, as global markets. And arguably, uh, we could have been doing a lot better right now. And then third, uh, I'm sorry, Biden did everything he could to promote the conflict with Ukraine. Uh, he wanted that conflict for purposes of distraction. That's why we're not negotiating a, a peaceful resolution now. Pete analyzes this every day. Pete, uh, I, uh, I think your overall theme is, correct me if I'm wrong, they're just going to grind Ukraine down until they're done with it and they win. There's no, there's no, unless- That certainly is the strategy. Uh, and, 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 and there's, and, yeah. If and I, that's can, why I can focus yeah, on please. a little first thing, yeah. then- uh, you know the the Russian the Russian understanding here is simply that uh, if they can push this war into a war of attrition, uh, they're going to win. And uh, it it needs to be understood that if we if we simply keep pushing ordnance and, and and weaponry into Ukraine, but uh, don't provide other uh, uh, pieces to the, to solving the problem. Um, this war will grind on until the last Ukrainian, and and uh, that you know there's a I have a real horror here because I I I would like the Ukrainians uh, to to win and to thrive and survive here, um, and what I see is a distinct possibility. We don't know how one of the issues being we never know how a war ends uh, beforehand, but there is a distinct possibility, a growing possibility that Ukraine will be left a destroyed ruin uh, by the time this war is over, and that is right. a horrible horrible thing to contemplate if you take a real hard look at what a war looks like when when it turns into this kind of slaughter but if you if you press press outward on that when you look at things like the the dis disruption in the global um, food supply chain the disruption in the global energy supply chain and the disruption in all the associated uh, ancillary uh, 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 industries, we have a growing, uh, uh, if you will, avalanche of problems. One of the one of the simple things here that that, that uh, was is a deliberately manufactured problem because they the the uh, Democrats wanted to uh, push the the green agenda was the uh, changing of the rules and regulations concerning the uh, ability of uh, businesses to invest in oil production, uh, oil transportation, oil refinery, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The result is that the oil industry, while only in the United States, while only changing the amount of oil they're producing by, uh, it's, it's less than 5%, I think, but the, dis the change in all the ancillary pieces has caused a, a, a truly substantial problem in, in uh, the oil industry that has rippled out through the rest of the of the planet. We have diesel fuel has doubled, and when or nearly so. And when you look at what diesel actually does, diesel powers the trucks that move the economy. Man. We are we are on the verge right now of running out. Not that is to say, no oil, no diesel fuel in the tanks uh, in much of the, uh, <laughs> the northeast corridor. And when that means, what that really means is. Groceries don't get delivered to the grocery store. The, the cost of fuel and fertilizer combined, the cost of fuel and fertilizer combined is better than 50% of the cost of running a farm. 
And and 50 55% in fact is the, is sort of the common number and varies between types of farms. But you then add on to that is all those crops are delivered by trucks. Those trucks are powered by diesel fuel. They're not gonna be powered by electric engines. You can't get an electric engine to run efficiently enough and effectively enough. The Volvo made a truck that costs more than $600,000 a piece that has a 220 mile range electric truck. It's ridiculous. <laughs> you, it, it will, that, that will not work. And so uh, and meanwhile, we need, we face this very simple problem of the, the Northeast corridor, the most heavily densely populated section of this country is, is rapidly approaching as in the next couple of weeks, they could very easily run out of diesel fuel, which means no more delivery of, of groceries. And there are four days of groceries left in an average grocery store when it's full, four days. Exactly. There, there are two critical psychological aspects on different parts of the, of the economy, but there's the psychological aspect on the, on the oil companies, which is that if every time the Democrats take power, they wipe out their leases and they, and they stop pipelines in the middle. So at a certain point, you're just not gonna invest anymore. So then even if Republicans take the power back and they say, here, we're opening all the leases, they're going, Why, what, for what purpose? So that four years from now, uh, the next Democrat will shut me down. It doesn't make sense. So, that, so that's on the, on the high point of the psychology of, of the big players. And then on the low point is basically, if the food doesn't get to the markets, that's going to get the man in the street very upset. And in America, they don't make revolutions, but the economy, if the people in the street are, are not feeling that they can go to the store and buy the products, it's, I mean, we can't predict exactly, but it's going to be very, very bad for every. I, mean, I, I, would, I would ask anybody who lives in the Northeast corridor to remind, remember the last time they drove the New Jersey Turnpike. Oh, yes. Okay. Drive, I can tell you that. <laughs> it's you know, not it, fun. It, it, <laughs> and you drive along the New Jersey Turnpike, though, starting at about 100 miles out from, from New York City, you start seeing very large warehouse buildings on either side of the road. Huge warehouses. Those warehouses feed New York City. They feed metropolitan New York. They are, there was a constant stream of, of tractor trailers of, of diesel powered trucks <laughs> pulling into those warehouses empty and leaving those warehouses full and heading back up into New York City. They keep New York City going. And if you take away the diesel fuel, they stop moving and New York City stops running. Right. Yes. So to that point, this is, a, the Biden administration came in with a clear set, uh, uh, set of objectives that they've implemented and to reduce to reduce capacity as stipulated was one of them to begin uh, stopping. And he said this, he's doing it. He plans on stopping all fossil fuel from being used without any regard to the damage you know, within the next 10 years, which is insane. And so that's part of what's going on. It's, it's that intent. Does, do you guys know how many uh, refiners have been built between 1976 and this year? Zero. No. No, one in Texas, 1919, oh, okay. 2019, one. So I can tell you for a fact that statistically one refinery, I got the information right here, the uh, Targa Resource Corporation uh, built a uh, 35,000 barrel per day uh, condensation spiller in, in Channel View, Texas in 1919, that's it. So, and so has our economy grown since then, since 76? Oh yeah, does it, does it grown to the level of only one refinery? No. And what Pete said is, and also Pete going along that same corridor, what do you see also? Big containers, Sunoco, big old uh, 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 um, tanks, huge tanks, you know, and there's refineries there too. If you can't refine that what you don't have. And if they're not getting fuel in to refine, they're just going to shut down. And by the way, you shut down refineries, that's a long-term proposition. They, you can't just turn them on and off. They have to be constantly running. Uh, otherwise, they will they will freeze up. That, that material in that process will just freeze in the pipes, and you've got a real problem then. So this is no small thing. And if, 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 if they continue, they, the Biden administration, continues to 
uh, I would say administratively uh, damage the energy production industry, you're going to see a hard failure of of economics. I mean, to the point distribution logistics by by September. So, and, and and to just jump on that again is the reason why there have been so few refineries built in the last sixty years is because of deliberate efforts during de democratic administrations, deliberate efforts by the Department of Justice to target uh, the refinery uh, owners uh, over a whole host of, of uh, uh, lawsuits, uh, uh, civil lawsuits, et cetera, uh, that, that basically punished the refineries for uh, producing oil and in their, uh, you know, as, a, as an outcropping of it, also having produced some, uh, some uh, pollution. And, and the pollution, the pollution is maybe unfortunate, but I would rather have a little bit of pollution and and have food than have uh, less pollution and be starving to death. Personally. We don't. We do not have. Again, if there was an alternative universe of uh, non-polluting fuel, and they were trying to promote it, at least you can live with that. The problem is they do not have an alternative. There is no alternative. They, they say there will be in the future. Great. So, you know, wait. But we're not, we're not ready for it now. And you want to see rolling blackouts? Try try the this ambitious idea that the Biden administration is, uh, has put forth saying we, we shouldn't be selling uh, gas cars by the time 2035 rolls around. Uh, I, I don't think our national grid not only will be able to handle it in, in two or three years, if they're trying to force more people to buy electric cars, but let's put it this way: What's traffic going to be like? Have you ever, again, you, uh, uh, Pete, you brought up the for different reasons. You brought up the uh, New Jersey Turnpike, but have you seen gas lines on some of the busy days? Sometimes you're waiting out to here. You got to wait for your gas to get pumped, and it'll take a few minutes. It takes a long time to charge in an electric car until this until it's perfected, where where the charges are a lot quicker and it could take you a lot farther. Aside from maybe uh, 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 seven or eight bubble cities where it might be feasible to drive electric cars, you can't do that. Commuters can't keep doing this, driving 100 to 120 miles a day. Uh, people who people who uh, drive for a living, haulers, or people who uh, uh, have pickup trucks and they have to get get from one job to another, probably 100 to 120 miles apart sometimes as well, in the middle of America, aren't going to be able to handle uh, doing their jobs anymore. Costs are going to go up. Uh, the grid's not going to be able to handle all this all this pressure from uh, from electric vehicles, and we don't have the infrastructure or the uh, the ability to fix the infrastructure in the next 10, 15 years to even to even handle all that. So what they're going to do effectively is cripple the nation. Uh, yeah, we're going to go somewhere else. Right. You know, it's important too to add in is that the physics simply isn't there. Right. You, you're battery, at the mercy of the government at that time too. Right, but you're never going to make a battery that weighs the same as the battery right now in a Tesla, but can move the car 600 miles. No, that's that's not going to happen. You can't do that. The physics is fairly clear on that. Uh, the the idea too of a truck, of an electric truck, those uh those uh, electric semis uh, that have the 200 and whatever it is, 30 40 mile range, uh, takes 70 minutes to get an 80 percent charge. So 70 minutes that the guy is sitting on the side of the road charging, assume he has a charge station. Uh, well, it's ridiculous. Uh, it, uh, you, you, it, does, it does not add up, and it cannot add up. Deepwoods Creations adds. Uh, uh, what about school buses? That's another one. Of well, course, I, look, I, smaller I, ones. I, I am, you know, someone. I have, as someone who has an actual degree in environmental studies, I'm not against the idea of, of finding and developing new forms of energy which are, are cleaner and more right. reliable. But, but as Pete said, the physics and and the reliability just aren't there. Uh, I'm a proponent of actually developing these things using DOD dollars. And the reason is uh, a DOD has the need to maintain military operations in an austere environment where power and, is, is lost and fuel may, may not be available. So the idea is to have something. Something is better than nothing always, right? So the idea would be is if you do have, and I'm not against having green vehicles in the military. I'm a green, you're not, it's just... You cannot rely on that as your lead. You, you get, I think that you should have a small percentage of things which are available to, to, to be resilient. Uh, and, I would, and I've been also saying you should bring back analog technology from World War II because that's, that's not dependent on any electronic 
uh, uh, brain. It, it doesn't require microchips. It just it just does stuff. So this is what I propose: a balanced, effective strategy. Imagine that that we should actually examine what would work regarding the spectrum of, of hazards, some man-made, some natural, to create a, a policy which addresses all of this. Thank you for watching this clip of Thought to Action Live presented by the Herb London Center for Policy Research. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the big red bell for updates so you know when we're putting anything out. Also, check out our Teespring store and our website, londoncenter.org. The Teespring store has all sorts of uh, pretty cool stuff we put out there. We have new t-shirt designs coming out soon and much more. The link is in our description. You can watch our full live stream on our Patreon channel, patreon.com slash thought to action. That's patreon.com slash thought to action. Once again, that link is also in the description. Also, as a member of our Patreon page, you can see sneak previews of our programs, watch them before anybody else. Exclusive content will be available and you'll have access to our full Ask Us Anything sessions where we answer your questions. Once again, thank you very much for watching this clip of our live stream. Stay informed and make your day a great one.